Ladies, gentlemen, no very reactions thereupon. Today we're going to be doing some experimental archaeology and seeing if we can determine how Minoan dresses are constructed. I have a theory and I'm going to put it to the test in this method of construction. So let's talk about sources. So the first thing we need to consider when we're talking about something historical is sources. Now, because this is so long ago and we can't actually read their writing, we can read a later version of their writing, which is written in Greek, but that's long after the mainland Greek influence has taken over the island. Uh, the only thing we've got to rely on are reconstructed uh, pictures that are on walls. The issue with this and these reconstructions is a lot of them are built up based on very little evidence. There's very little actual plaster on the wall. The rest of it is just made up around. Now they have made up that image based on uh, the surviving pieces on other fragments but the fact that they've had to fill in so much of it means that this sort of image is about as useful for trying to understand uh, Minoan dress as trying to understand Roman dress from watching Ben-Hur. So the sources I'm going to use are going to be some of these uh, frescoes and these wall paintings where the whole image itself is more complete. There's more of it there from the initial plaster so less of it's been added. And the other thing I need to consider is what sort of dress I'm going to make. See there is two real main styles. There's the iconic style which is the uh, snake goddess or snake priestess which is obviously a woman in power she has this very elaborate, long, layered dress that just goes all the way around. Her chest is out and she's holding snakes. And we found statues of this sort of person. The other sort of dress is one that's not seen as often, I don't think, but it's on some of the more complete images, which is of less a dress and more of a robe. And it seems to be worn by mostly the women working in fields as on this image of the uh, saffron pickers. Although there is a woman there watching them who is seen as the saffron goddess, but no reason to think she actually is a goddess rather than someone overseeing. Uh, she's sitting on her ass, so she's not a worker. She's wearing a similar kind of dress. And what we can see from these sorts of images and a lot on the other images as well, is that these dresses are not actual dresses. They are robes, they're not uh, something that's worn all the way down and forms a complete circle all the way around their legs. It's something that's open at the front. What it looks like they have is, first they have a robe that goes ankle length, starts uh, at the shoulder, goes halfway down the arm and goes all the way down the body. And I think it goes all the way down the body because if you look at the dresses, the colour on the last layer of the dress is the same as the bodice section. So. It looks like they've got, they've got one thing going all the way down with extra layers placed on top of it. The other thing that they seem to have is an apron around the front. They have the chest exposed on a lot of these, so they're not particularly bothered about nudity. And a lot of people in the ancient world weren't bothered about nudity. But they seem to have some sort of taboo around the crotch area because they, rather than having it open all the way down, they have an apron sort of section which is worn to cover that front part and is tied at the back as you can see on this woman who's picking the saffron. And when it comes to actually creating these dresses, uh, the thing that I'm going to keep in mind is other cultures at the same time. See, in the ancient world, all the ancient cultures I know of, when they try and create some sort of clothing, they don't do it the way that we do it and the way people in the medieval era did it, by taking a rectangle of cloth, cutting it into sections and then reassembling them into the garment. What they tend to do is take a rectangle of clothing and drape it somehow. Uh, the most cutting and sewing I've ever seen is in Northern Europe where it's a lot colder and that was, I created, recreated the uh, blouse up here, was just a rectangle with two cuts folded over and then sewn to the arm and an extra hole at the top for the head. It's very simple sort of garments and the reason they do that is because it's quick and easy. You don't need loads of skill to do it because everyone's making their own clothes. You can't rely on the fact that the person making the clothes is going to necessarily be skillful. And the other thing is very little waste. Once you've woven your cloth, you're basically done. All you've got to do is drape it, pin it. And the Egyptians did that, as you've seen in other videos that I've made, by just having a rectangular cloth that they pin there, pull up, pin there, and they've got a dress. The Sumerians, so people from Uruk, Ur, Eridu, uh, 
they sort of people would have worn that kind of dress. That's a work in progress. You don't look at it too closely because it's not finished. But this is just a rectangle of cloth that's wrapped around. It still needs to be cut down a little and it's got animal wool for detail, but I'm not talking about Sumerian stuff at the moment. That's a work in progress. Ignore it, stop looking at it. Anyway, back to Minoans. Minoans, I think, probably would have done very much the same sort of thing, especially if you're one of the women that's working in the field, you're not necessarily going to be able to afford an elaborate, finely constructed dress like these snake goddesses had. You're going to have something that's quick, easy to put together and isn't going to create much waste because you're probably going to be spending a lot of your time just weaving the cloth. So once you've woven a section of cloth, you want to get that around you with as little work added as possible. So with that in mind, let me show you the sort of thing that I've come up with trying to recreate Minoan. Eight feet. Okay, so for this bit, I'm not certain exactly how well the microphone is going to perform. So there might be a voiceover coming and me just muted. So let me just take this off. Now, what this dress made out of, I'm guessing linen. Linen was readily available in the ancient world and the two cheapest forms of uh, fabric have always been linen and wool until the industrial revolution when cotton became cheaper. As it's a hot country, I think linen would probably be the sort of fabric they would go for. And judging by how these dresses look, they have this uh, band that runs along the arm and then along the edge of the um, of the dress and why do they have that band over on there i think what they're doing is they're binding the edges of the fabric and the seam on the sleeve so which means they have a seam that runs across the sleeve and then to the neck i think they've got a fabric like this place it over themselves and they're basically so they've taken a bit from down here and pinned it up here which would mean that they'd have a seam that would run down what would make the sleeve up there and some of the material would have to be cut off from this rectangle in order to make it but then that leaves this open framing the chest because remember they left their chest exposed on virtually all the images that I can see that if by putting fabric from down the side there and putting it up it does create a nice framing of the chest and if that was done on both sides you've got sort of a robe shape that can then once you've got something tied around the waist area, the apron, it holds it in together and forms the skirt that will still open. As for the sleeve, some of it will need to be cut off. In order to get that up there, it means that this length there on the side is what's going to form the sleeve there. And then it's going to have some sort of tape or something covering the side up. Oh, and then when it comes to the skirts, I'm pretty sure what they will have done is because the very bottom there, as I've said, is going to be the same colour as the actual robe, so I think it goes all the way down. The other layers, I think they've just got smaller sections of fabric and have just sewn them to the outside to give a layered effect, sort of like that. So we've got a orange layer and then a blue layer on like this that wraps around. Obviously this is very rough, but the overall layered effect may look something more like this. Okay, so this is largely what I was thinking. This fabric is slightly wider than is needed, so there's a bit of extra material at the front, and you have to slightly excuse this sleeve because I've just had to repin it because the pin had fallen out and I didn't have the mirror rather than going back into the other room. I just pinned it there and then, which means it's slightly off. But if you pay attention to my left-hand side, uh, then, this will give source the effect. So we've got it pinned at the arms so that once we take away the excess material, it'll come up like this. And the reason I think they did it this way is that once we've tied the apron around the waist and pulled this in, it frames the chest, which is what's always shown. So I think they did do it this way with it sort of looping in a big circle around the neck and framing the chest and being pulled in. All right, so that's sewn up. So it's secured there, and as you can see, with the excess cut off, 
it wraps around and frames just nicely and it goes down just to my ankles now rather than trailing on the floor and there's less of a like bat wing sort of thing up there that you get when you open up your arms but there's not really much there anyway so the next part is to cover up the seams with this tape uh, i've tried to go for an elaborate design as possible because they seem to always have some sort of elaborate design tape at the side and that's just going to cover up the seams there wrap around the arm go along the neck and then go down to the waist as i the side being careful not to knock them i can make it sound terrible it's going to be a lot of pinning and a lot of sewing but you know sewing machine makes it go a lot quicker they would have had to do it by hand So I've done as much as I can do on the machine, but apparently I'm an idiot. I forgot the fact that I can't just sew that on the machine, can I? Because I'm gonna sew onto the other side if I try running that through. The sleeves are just slightly too long for me to rock them up. I probably could get it done, but it's gonna make a mess. So uh, I'm gonna to have to do that by hand, which does mean that the skirt sections are going to be finished tomorrow rather than today, like I was hoping, because by the time I've got these hand stitched on and watch lower decks while I do it, uh, it's going to be too late for me to be running the sewing machine over the skirts. The next day. So after I finished filming yesterday, I decided to carry on working and I cut some of the fabric to size. Now, uh, back in the day, back in Minoan times and throughout much of human history, when you were weaving things yourself, you would have had a set width, which was going to be the width of the loom and you would have just woven up the amount of fabric that you needed, not bothered with the rest. So back in the day, they probably would have had a lot less waste than us. We only probably need about a metre in width. One thing I didn't cut out though, were the straps that go around the apron. So we're going to uh, do that a bit first. And for that, I'm going to use this a black linen that you may remember from my Star Wars skirt. I've also cut out smaller strips of it, which are going to be borders for the coloured fabric. Because if you look at their dresses, they've got block of colour then uh, a darker band and then the block of colour and then a darker band on there but for the straps I'm going to put it so uh, the straps wrap around the outside and come back and tied in the back which looks like what they've got on the majority of their dresses and that will create the extra dark band between the red of the top and the uh, yellow of the apron and the way we're going to do that is going to take the full length of the fabric and we're just going to cut out just a few centimetres and we're going to fold this over so that the raw edge is on the inside and then sew up directly along the outside of it. And the reason I'm doing it that way is because the straps, in order to get a good tie on them, they have to be thin and it's gonna be very difficult turning something that long. I'm also going to have to, with a lot of this dark part of the fabric, um, use a contrasting color. So I'm going to use a white on top of the black fabric. And uh, I'd like to say that that's because I'm go going to try and pick up the motif of the, um, the actual tape that I've sewn on the outside of it because that's black and white. Uh, in actuality it's because I'm almost out of black thread and uh, I can't really be bothered to wait until I've ordered a new one or go out shopping to buy a new one because the pollen count's far too high for me outside. So I'm just going to cut a strip off there and get on with making the straps. And the way we're going to fold this then is pushing the raw edges in towards the centre and then folding over and then we're just going to pin and sew along that so that we seal it all down it'll be top stitched down there so those took longer than expected but now that they're done they're out of the way so the next thing i need to do is to take the uh, little apron that's going to be wrapped around as you can see i've already pinned in the sides where they're going to be hemmed and I've uh, secured the bottom with the black linen. This is just to cover the raw edge, it's folded over in half with the raw edges pointing inwards. And these are going to be secured up the top with a thread colour that matches the fabric and it's just going to be same as the uh, other sides, folded over so that the raw edges are on the inside but it's also going to have these on the inside so that they out and this can be used to wrap around the waist and then tie off at the end. Okay. 
Okay, so that's what the apron looks like when it's done with the straps sewn into the hem at the top. And the idea is you just place that around your waist, wrap it around yourself, and they're quite long, so I probably could get away with doing it twice. And those straps are longer than they need to be, but better to be too long than not long enough. And that's the way it will look when it's on. The next thing to do is to attach the two other panels, which will go underneath the blue one and the orange one. Now, the way those uh, are, are designed, the orange one, which sits underneath, it's the middle layer of the three, is actually as long as almost my ankle length, and the blue only comes down towards knee length. The reason for this is I want all the weight over my hips. The hips are a much better place to take the weight than the shoulders, and with these tied around my waist, that means that when I've got the dress on, all the extra fabric is going to be cinched in at the waist, at the waist height, so all of the weight will be put down onto the hips right there. Many unbearable hours later. So I've just spent uh, the last computer time. The time is 8.34 p.m. Last two hours trying to work out why the dress wasn't sitting properly. Basically, well, no matter how I was sewing it, I've had to unpick the seam several times and it just didn't seem to sit right. It didn't have that right look. Then, to sound a whim, I decided to put the apron on. And this isn't actually sewn at the minute. The skirts are all separate. This is only held on by the apron. So if it doesn't look right, if one side, I think this side, based on the viewfinder in the camera, looks slightly lower. But that's because it slipped round while I was sitting at the camera and everything. This, it's just held in place by the apron. And when you put the apron on and it pulls everything in, once you've got some tight around the waist, it sort of lines everything up and makes everything sit level. Eventually. And there we have it. So this is the final product. What have I done differently since the last time I filmed? Actually nothing. All I've done is take everything off wait a little while and then put it back on when I've calmed down because last time I put it on I'd been frustrated I'd not been able to get the skirts to sit right so you know I was a bit flustered when I put it on. This time I'd calmed down, put it on and everything seems to sit all right. These are virtually the same level now. I do have it folded slightly at the top to bring it up just a little bit because the uh, orange layer is a bit long. If I was to do it again I'd probably make that layer a bit shorter. And as you can see by my silly dance, you can move around quite a bit without anything falling out, despite the fact that this is all held in place by the apron, and virtually none of it is sewn. And here's an editor's note. I just had to put this on again to film whilst I did that little jig because I needed extra footage, and I decided just to keep this on because it's very comfy. It gets a little bit hot with the leggings on underneath, but that's mostly because of the leggings, because this is linen and it breathes very easily. So, I've got no problem just leaving this on. It's very comfortable. I've elected to put a tunic on underneath because YouTube and uh, this rough spun tunic is actually the thing that's most restrictive about what I'm wearing. It's not supposed to be for this outfit. I actually picked it up at Halgen when I was going to be executed for crossing the border near Rifting. Oh, it's a long story. Anyway, this is the finished product. So we've got three layers, the orange, uh, blue and yellow. And I know compared to that picture I just showed, the orange and the yellow are the opposite way around. But, you know, uh, I had more of the orange than I did of the yellow. But the way it all sits is these skirts are not sewn. They're just underneath the, obviously, as I just said, folded up. But the um, apron is holding it all together. So there's no actual stitching needed. And that brings me to what I've learnt from all this. You see, I don't think they're doing this as a way of showing off their sewing skills and making an elaborate dress. But I think back then they were using it as a way of showing off their weaving skills. You see all of these different layers on a lot of the pictures, they're elaborate, they've got patterns on them. Uh, and because these are basically just big rectangles, I think what they've done is they've woven some elaborate fabrics and then they've just draped them over themselves, tied them off. There's very little sewing. The only bit of sewing that's needed is on the arms, which is then covered by this tape, which again would be woven. So it's another chance to show off your weaving. And that fits in a lot with what I know about the ancient world. A lot of emphasis was put on weaving. Very little that I can see is put on sewing. And in the ancient world, garments tend to be draped and not sewn. Other than that, I think this is an approximation of how you could 
have done the uh, Minoan dress. Obviously we don't have their account of it, we're going purely on pictures, so everything's guesstimate and this was an experiment, this is really experimental archaeology. So that's my interpretation of it, if you want to see more historic sewing then check out this little playlist up here that I've got of all my historic garment constructions or if you want to see something else then this video down here has been picked out by the algorithm just for you. And if you click this little thing over here you can subscribe to the channel. See you next time.